But, uh, um, but I do want you to, to turn in your Bibles this morning as we talk about uh, our vision for this year in regard to share. Turn to First uh, Peter in chapter 3, and uh, we'll be looking at verses 15 and, and 16. I got to ask a question before we get started. How many of you have ever heard of Flagstaff Lake in Maine? It's like, oh yeah, I make trips to Maine all the time, Lucas. Don't you know? I, I know some of you, Flagstaff here, and all those things, you've probably heard of that. Uh, but maybe some of us don't make a, a trip that far uh, northeast. But Flagstaff uh, Lake in Maine is the fourth largest lake in Maine. It's like, oh, well, great. Thanks for that a little bit. It's a man-made lake, uh, over 20,000 acres. Uh, it's about, uh, at its deepest, uh, it's about 50 feet. But below the surface, it hides a secret. Below the surface is the remains of the town of Flagstaff. See, some hundred years ago or so, the, uh, um, the Eastern Maine uh, Electric Company uh, was buying up some different subsidiaries and decided to make a dam, a hydroelectric dam. And in order to do so, they would have to, of course, build the dam, but in the floodplain would be certain areas. And one of those happened to be this town called Flagstaff. So in 1930, they knew that they had to do this, so they went in and started buying up tracts of land, buying out families that lived there. But many people decided they didn't want to buy, or they didn't want to sell their land. They didn't want to, they didn't want to leave when the power company wanted them to. So for some 20 years, up until the floodwaters came in 1950, they stayed there. Now they watched trees being taken down. They watched those that had left, uh, their homes being destroyed. They, they watched the church building come down, all these different things, but they remained, to stay, they remained there. Now it would be kind of pointless for them, but as they continued to live there, they didn't really do anything at their home. They didn't paint anything. They didn't upkeep it because they thought to themselves, there's no hope. There's no for hope for tomorrow. We'll just hang out, hang on as long as we can. And sure enough, in 1950, when they released the water, they had left. They didn't stay there to drown, but they watched as the water crept up and slowly over their homes. You see, they had no hope while they lived there. They knew that the end was coming. And they lived like that, by allowing their homes just to fall apart. They lived there in just a cloud of pessimism. A great quote that kind of came out of it in the midst of it was, where there's no hope in the future, there's no power in the present. Now granted, we hopefully are not facing any kind of circumstances like that where we live and the things that we experience on a regular basis. But when we think about our faith, we think about the work that Christ does in us, I pray that we have real hope. Hope that is evident to other people. That we're not just hanging on to possibilities, but we trust in God's promises. So this morning, as we have come to this third or fourth, I guess you could say, Vision Sunday, talking about where we're going this year and what God's doing in the life of our fellowship, we've talked about worship We've talked about growth and discipleship, but this week we're talking about sharing. We're talking about being a, a witness for Christ in our community, being a witness for Christ wherever our feet personally take us. So I direct your attention again to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Peter, writing to churches in Asia Minor, he says this, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks of you a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect and a good, good conscience so that when you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for just a chance to reflect upon your truth. We pray this morning as we seek to, uh, to, to understand it, as we seek to apply it to our life, Lord, that we'll understand its significance in the fact that, Lord, so many years ago, through the pen of, of your apostle Peter, you encouraged these saints 
to hold fast, to, to, to reflect on the hope that they had on you. Lord, to be ready to provide an answer for their faith. Lord, that is a timeless truth that today we encounter. Lord, in the midst of our everyday life, being able to, to live in such a way but it, that it's observable that our hope and faith is in you. So I pray today as we work through this passage and reflect upon its principles that our hearts will be drawn to you and, Lord, that we'll be emboldened to be a, a stronger witness for Christ who has changed each and every one of our lives through faith. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. But this morning, as we look at this passage, uh, it's important for us to acknowledge its context. We see that Peter is writing to these churches in Asia Minor, and they're experiencing persecution. They're experiencing suffering because of their faith. So he's encouraging them. He's, he's calling them to, to persevere. He's calling them, in the midst of that perseverance, to holiness, but also to action. And we'll see that in our, our, the way we'll reflect on this. Now, I have to admit, I tried to, tried to do a little bit of a parallelism here in my outline. Internal uh, submission and external confession. So I tried to get on the right page. Uh, but we'll first look at internal submission. This call to uh, get our heart right with the Lord, if you will. Looking in verse uh, 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Now, as you're reading along with us, maybe your translation renders that a little differently. And what it's speaking to there is the Lordship of Christ. Another way of rendering it is this, but set apart Christ as Lord in your heart. You know, even in the midst of their struggling, in the midst of their suffering, Peter is calling them to make sure the Lord is first place. Make sure that you're submitting to His work in your life. St. Augustine says it this way, if Jesus is not, valued at, is not valued at all until he's valued above all. Let me say that again. Jesus is not valued at all until he's valued above all. Meaning that he deserves it all. He deserves to be the very Lord of our life. And it's when that happens that we sure, truly illustrate his value to us. That there's nothing that compares to him. So Peter writing to these churches, Peter's words led by the Holy Spirit or given by the Holy Spirit echoing through the ages to us tells us that we're to put Christ first in all things. And when we do that, it changes us. When we do that, it has a visible effect on our life. Others see it. We're called to live in submission to Christ. Our internal submission has external fruit. Excuse me while I get my, my water here. We don't have a coughing fit. So think about that. What's happening on the inside of us will be seen on the outside. They're inseparable. When our heart is right with the Lord, it's observable to other people. When our, we're, de <coughs> excuse me, we're dedicated to the Lord, other people will notice it. There'll be fruit in our life that'll, that'll uh, bring attention to Him. Just as, as He says there, you're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither does anyone light a lamp and put it under a bushel, bushel but he, he leaves it to, out to, to light up so that they may see your good, we, good deeds. I'll get the words out in a minute. They'll see your good deeds and bring glory to your Father. Paul writing says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me through faith. This idea that it's no longer us, but Christ is the one that's ruling our life. He's the one working through us. We're yielding to the Spirit's work in our life. And when that happens, there's an external effect. People see that we love the Lord. By the way, we, we live our life, the way we um, carry ourselves at work, the way we, we, uh, we lead our family. They see there's a devotion, there's an allegiance to God. They see that we love the Lord. They see that we have a, a disdain for sin. If Christ is indeed ruling over our heart, then our heart has the same desires that He has. So therefore, there's a disdain, a hatred toward sin. It's not something that we entertain. It's not something that uh, we allow to, to stay in our life. And when we do fall, we realize how severe it is and we seek to repent and turn away from it. Exercising a godly sorrow. When we allow the Lord to be our, our life, not only do we show, reveal a love for the Lord, not only do we have a, a disdain for sin, but then we have a love for other people. You know, just as, as Adam helped us be mindful of this morning. 
A love for other people. Yes, love for those that belong to the Lord. We're to love our brethren. We're to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. To do whatever it is that we need to do to, to be there for them, to minister to them, to serve alongside them, just as the Lord loves them. We're to love them. But also we're to have a love for people that, honestly, don't, that don't, that don't fit here. That aren't here, I should say. That are outside of that relationship with the Lord. We're to go and to love for them and to care for their needs and to seek to connect with them in such a way that they understand how much God does love them and how they have a, a need for Him in their own life. So when we have a, uh, allowing the Lord to be the Lord of our life, we have a love for the Lord, a hatred towards sin, and a love for other people. Those things should characterize us and those should be evident to others around us. That lordship that exists in our heart produces a hope that is in us as we see that play out in this verse. So as we focus our primary attention to this external confession today, I think it's an imperative that we understand is that we live in submission to Christ, our hope will become evident to others. Well, let's think about hope. What is hope? Now, I think that word that we use for hope sometimes has got... Uh, has lost its significance. Like I could say, I hope the Cardinals are going to win the World Series this year. Okay, I can't guarantee that, but I have a real. I hope it's possible. Maybe it's better better equated with the word wish. Okay, I hope I wake up tomorrow and you know all my bills are paid, or I hope tomorrow you know I don't have this cough. Or, you know we could go on and on and talk about all these things we hope for, and it's kind of like yeah, I wish it. It's possible. But when we're talking about hope in this context, we're talking about a certainty. And it's a certainty based on a promise that God has made. And we know the God of the Scriptures, and we know the God that saved us, we know that that promise will come to pass. Obviously, here in this context, as, as Peter is writing to the churches, he's talking about their eternal hope. While they may be facing hardship in this context, hardship in the here and now, he's pointing to the fact that a day is coming when that hardship will be gone. A day is coming when you'll, you'll be in the Father's presence. And that's a promise. It's not a possibility. It's not a maybe if you're good enough. No, it'll happen if you truly have faith. If you truly have trusted in the work of Christ. It's a certainty. God will keep His promises. The certainty of the fulfillment of God's promises mean this, that a day will come when our sin, our sin is already forgiven through Christ, but we'll no longer feel the effects of it. Our broken down bodies, our, our lack of better words, our depraved minds will be set at ease. They'll be brought into full restoration. They'll be brought into perfection. They'll be brought in communion with Christ Himself. That's part of our hope. That's part of a promise. That's something that's certain that's going to happen for each and every one of us if we place our faith and our trust in Christ. The forgiveness of our sin, the forgiveness of our transgressions, the rest restoration of our brokenness. There'll be a change in status for us. Now that's already happened, but, but we'll experience it. We'll no longer have to face the certainty of hell, but now we look forward to the eternal fellowship with the Father. In heaven, that eternal communion with Him, that joy that never ends, that satisfaction in, in God that, that will have no, no, no end in sight. That's what awaits us. That's part of our eternal hope. That's part of the promises that will happen. We also see as a, well, honestly, a side blessing of that, a communion or a reunion, if you will, with those saints that have gone ahead of us, those brothers and sisters. While on this side of eternity, maybe they were more than a brother or sister. Maybe they were a spouse. Maybe they were a mother or father or whatever. We could talk about our close friend that trusted in the Lord. But now they've gone on to be in His presence. Our hope, our promise, a certainty is we'll be returned to them as well. And we'll rejoice with them. Be reunited with them. But the greatest aspect of that, of course, forgiveness, of course, Eternal life, of course, reunion, but being with the Father Himself. That great hope, that promise that awaits us, 
each and every one of us, and we dabbled in this this morning in Sunday school, created in God's image, will be fulfilled in eternity. Each and every one of us will be in our Father's presence and will know Him and have a relationship with Him. That great hope that rests ahead of all of us. That promise that is there waiting for us. This hope that, that is there for us. So as we live in submission to the Lord, that hope, that certainty, those promises become evident in our life. Now the Lordship of Christ there, as we, we hold on to Him, we realize that hope, He gives us uh, resilience, He gives us a boldness. As we see in this context, as we're, we're looking here, these, uh, Peter encourages them to be ready. Be ready to give a defense for your faith. If you say you believe in Christ and you've submitted to Him, then your life's going to show it. So those on the outside will notice there's something different about you. Now granted, we're talking in their context here, we're talking about them being persecuted. We're talking about them losing their life. Their homes being taken from them. Their possessions taken. Their families being uh, torn apart. All of this because of the hope that they have in Christ. It is abundantly clear that they belong to Jesus because the way they've aligned their life with Him. So He tells them, be ready to give a defense. Give a defense. Because the enemy, those that are on the outside, are on the offense. They are persecuting you. He says, be ready. Be ready to tell them, in season, out of season, why it is that you have this hope. This hope that transcends the now, that looks toward a future day, that looks toward eternity. This promise of tomorrow that they have that, that helps them to sustain. Colossians 4, 5 and 6 tells us this, walk in wisdom towards outsider, outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer each person. These inquiries that will come because of, of their faith. He tells them to be ready and how to respond. He says to do it with gentleness and respect. So when we do that, we reveal, in fact, the Lordship of Christ in us. We reveal the work that He's done in our hearts. And given us this, uh, this posture of, of, of compassion. This posture of compassion when we're met with aggression. These folks are losing their life. They're losing their homes. All these things. And he says, when they ask you why, you don't get in their face. You be gentle. Be respectful. You speak to them as the Lord would speak to them. And that's exactly what we see. That example of Christ. There is, he's being beaten. He's being ridiculed. He's being, uh, they're asking Him inquiries about who He is. And instead of bringing down the wrath of his father, instead of bringing legions of angels to wipe them out, he submits like a sheep to slaughter. A gentleness and respect. And it says there in the scriptures, it tells us those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Indeed, we see that those that persecuted Christ were put to shame. Because in the midst of that, they realize that these, the hope that these individuals have is true. The hope that they have has given them a boldness, a certainty, so much so that they're willing to face persecution and even death because of how true these promises are, how true this hope is. Now, most likely... None of us in this room will experience some of the persecution the first century church experienced. And we may have some, uh, some hostility that's expressed to us at work or some things that are said or maybe, maybe treated a little unfairly maybe because of our faith and our convictions. But most likely, none of us in this room will, will lose our life or our, our family or our home because of our hope in Christ. And we know that there's brothers and sisters around the world that are they're experiencing that now. In fact, at the end of our service, as far as our missions moment, we'll watch a, a, a prayer reminder for the persecuted church. 
But the question still needs to be asked of us, even though we don't have people knocking down our door trying to take us out of our home because of our faith, we need to ask ourselves how visible is our hope in Christ? How visible is the Lordship of Christ in your life? So much so that you live with an eternal hope. You live with a, a perspective on the life to come, an eternal perspective as opposed to being wrapped up in the world and its, and its, uh, its perspective, the, the world and its desires. And making a name for yourself in this world, as we noted this morning in looking at the Tower of Babel. I want us to consider that individually and I want us to consider that as, as brothers and sisters united here at Echota Baptist Church. First, individually, how visible is your faith? Those people that, that live with you, is your faith compartmentalized? You know, one of the things, and I know I've shared these type of illustrations with you countless times, but just the blessing that the Lord gives me of, of being able to teach at Shorter and interact with students and some that have so many different journeys. <clears throat> this semester as I'm teaching a New Testament survey class, and one of the very first assignments is a Your Journey paper, and they just kind of share their their spiritual background or their understanding of it because you know some of them just have no clue what we're even talking about and that's that's fine i want them to be real but several of them as i'm working through it, i haven't graded them all I'm, I'm getting there but several of them this semester have noted that they grew up in church but that's where it stayed when they went on sunday and they went on wednesday that faith that belief in christ that was that was talked about, stayed in that building. Sometimes it made its way out to the parking lot. Over and over again, what they had experienced was a compartmentalized belief where their home life was a mess and how they lived just like the rest of the world. You know, and I pray that you'll pray alongside me as, as I have the opportunity this semester to be with those students and, and speak to them about the faith of, of the New Testament and what it really means to follow Christ and what a real relationship is. I hope that you'll pray alongside me that they, their eyes will be open. But for this today, as we talk about this, I pray that for each one of us, we realize that our faith is not just here. It moves beyond that. It moves beyond when we're not together in this room, but it, it's a faith that needs to be visible to the rest of the world. Because when it's visible to the rest of the world, they notice it. And whether we're talking about the context of persecution or we're talking about the, the context of just curiosity, they'll ask questions. They'll want to know what makes you different. How can you place your faith in someone that lived 2,000 years ago? How can, how can you devote part of your day to a, a book that was originally written in Hebrew and Greek. How can you give part of your weekend up to, to be with people you really don't even know? You see, on the outside, it doesn't make any sense. But when we live in such a way, a powerful way, because of the lordship of Christ in our heart, the hope that drives us, that's evident, they have to ask. Because it doesn't make sense to them. But here's the part. Are we ready to give the answer? Peter's telling this church, the churches here, be ready in season, out of season, to give a defense. Whether they be aggressive or not, be ready to share with them the hope that you have in Christ. You know, just some practical notes, and I know we've talked about this before, but I, I just encourage each one of you, and I know many of you have done this, and we've done it in different contexts here, but to think through your story with Jesus. Think about your testimony. Think about ways that you can share that with people. Those that you're in, you're in close uh, contact with, those that maybe even live with you, those that you work with, those that you encounter regularly at the store, wherever it is, finding ways to give them uh, an answer for that hope that resides in you. Allowing them to see how that hope has changed you, not only in the way you live your life, but the way that you care for other people by sharing with them the hope of Christ. But then as we think as brothers and sisters, as we think corporately, what are some things that we can do to make it clear that our community understands 
that our hope is not in this world. Our hope is beyond that. Well, yes, we meet on Sunday. That's kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a big thing in the community. Okay, churches meet, so they're doing something different. But something that I, I've encouraged our, our deacons and, and our church council to do, and, I, and I, I may have mentioned it in this context as well, but I really want us to consider what type of impact we are having on our community. Does our community really know, first off, that we're even here? Does our community know that our hope in Christ is alive and and active? Our hope in Christ has changed us, not only personally, but has changed us in such a way that we long to connect with others, long to share with others. So the question I've, I've proposed, and I'll continue to propose moving forward, is if we were to close the doors here tomorrow, would our community even know? Maybe they'll read some online or something. Or will they feel, would they feel the impact in our community if our fellowship just closed its doors? I pray that they would. But if we're sitting there scratching our head or thinking, maybe, then we really need to search our hearts and see how how engaged we are with the community. Is our hope in Christ really driving us to meet people where they are? Again, we've talked about sitting up here on the hill and and longing to see people come and worship with us and and come in this building and see visitors, and we long for that. We look forward to those days, and it's always a blessing when we have guests with us. But we're called to come off the hill. Our posture should not be one sitting and waiting, but it's seeking to find. This year, we've talked some among the deacons and among the church council about some different things that that we feel that we could begin to work towards to connect with our community, to begin to provide a voice into their life. Things from a possible breakfast ministry uh, on Sunday mornings. We've talked about in the past, and I know we've had some transition in, uh, in the past year or so, but still on, on the, I guess you could say, the agenda's ESL classes, seeking to connect with some of our Hispanic uh, families in our community. And our bus ministry is, is booming right now. Poor Neil didn't get home till well after 9 o'clock sometimes. The needs are there. People want to know what's different about us. We've got to answer them. Yes, we need to answer them with our words and be able to proclaim that in our everyday life, but we need to answer that as a fellowship too. To stand up in the community and say, we believe in Christ and this is how we're going to show you. We're going to be there for you. We're going to connect with you at these points of need and help you to see the love of Christ through our actions. We go on and on and talk about possibilities and things, but what we really need to do is, is to see, okay, how has the Lord gifted us? How has He blessed us with certain resources? And how can we this lighthouse on the hill really connect with our community here. Our neighbors here, as we've talked about in previous years, focusing in on our, 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 this block around us, seeking so to connect with them and help them to see the hope that resides in us. So I encourage you, church, as we move forward into to 2024, as we look forward to opportunities to share with our community, you pray about how you can be a part of that whether it's a a needs-based ministry that we're working towards uh, this year, being a part of that in service, whether it's bringing it to the Lord in prayer, bathing it in prayer, praying that the Lord will give us sensitivity and and direction, whether it's giving towards a certain initiative as we make those things known, but being sensitive to His leadership as you submit to His Lordship in your life. Understanding that without Him, all of us stand outside of a relationship with God. But with Him, everything changes. And in that transformation of our heart comes a love for other people. Yes, a love for our brothers and sisters, but a love for our community. We should have a desire to reach them and share with them the hope that Christ has given us. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for... 
the challenges of your word. We thank you for, Lord, just uh, how you remind us of who we are in you. And Lord, the message that you've placed in all of our heart. So Father, I just pray that for all of us that we'll acknowledge those circles of influence that you've given us. Whether they be our home, our work, or the places that your, our feet take us. And Lord, help us to see those opportunities to share the hope that's in us. And Lord, I pray for us as a fellowship that we continue to identify uh, where we are and the needs of, of this community and seek to connect with them. Help them to see that we're just not sitting here hoping they'll come see us, but Lord, we'll be going to them, helping them to see Jesus in us. Father, I thank you so much that you've allowed us to be a part of your kingdom work. I just pray now as we uh, come to this time of invitation, if there's some here that uh, need to recommit themselves to you and to sharing that hope of Christ, Lord, that you'll move upon their hearts. Oh, Lord, Lord, maybe, Father, there's some here that, uh, that need to come and just rededicate their life or maybe some that need to come and join and be a part of our fellowship. Lord, I don't know, but you do. And I just pray that as they speak to your heart or as they speak... As you speak to their heart, Lord, they'll be obedient to you and follow you. Lord, use this time for your glory. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Mm -hmm.